songs talked about God's faithfulness and all that He is and how long does He last? Tell me, how long does God last? Forever. Forever, and that means His faithfulness lasts for how long? Forever. Forever, and it also means His peace lasts for how long? Forever. Forever, because everything that God is is forever. Amen? Don't forget that because you're going to need to know that during the message today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for an opportunity to give. And Father, we just surrender our hearts to you right now according to your word. Father, your word says that we should not give out of necessity. It also says we should not give grudgingly. But rather, Father, your word says that we should give with a cheerful heart. Because, Lord, your word actually says that you love a cheerful giver. So, Father, I pray that right now as these folks give, that they wouldn't do it out of a sense of duty. But, Father, they would do it because they love you. They realize that everything that they have is yours to begin with. And yet, Lord, you do this strange little thing for us. We give to you out of that which is already yours, and you choose to bless us. And for that, we thank you. We ask you to guide each heart today. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. 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 What? Yes. Sam told you, y'all never remind me of these things. Children, you are just this. They're back there waiting. Maybe they're going to come out. Maybe they're going to come back there somewhere. See, Daniel said you forgot to tell him to tell me that.
that can change our lives. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated. I'm going to ask you to turn your Bibles to Psalm 119. Psalm 119, that's the fat psalm. I was talking to a preacher. We've been in Psalms now on Wednesday nights here for I don't know how long. We're only in Psalm 51. I talked to a preacher right before, well, right as we first started teaching on the Psalms on Wednesday night. I talked to a preacher from Dr. Lexington one day, and he said, you know, he said, uh, we, we talked on the Psalms one time. He said, when we got to Psalm 119, it took us six months just to get through 119. Psalm 119's got a lot to it, but this is Psalm 119, 165. As you're turning there, let me read something to you. First of all, notice the title of the message. Instead of the path to perfect peace, because we know God has perfect peace. Amen? Amen? I mean, there's no doubt that God's peace is perfect. And generally, when you hear about God's peace, that's either what you're taught or that's what you understand. But what I want to show you today is that, man, the fact that God's peace is perfect goes without even saying. Amen. But I believe that there is a perfect path to that peace. That sometimes we miss. There's a whole lot of different things we try in our lives to find peace, isn't it? Yep. Man, people come up with all kinds of crazy ideas trying to find peace. They try to find it in a little bitty bottle. They try to find it in a bigger bottle. They try to find it in a can. They try to find it in a magazine, in a movie, in a dark room somewhere with folks that they don't need to be hanging with, whatever. Amen. He said, man, that's right, people are just sent it. You ready then? Because now that you've got your old hallelujah good, goody two-shoes on, I'm going to smack you right in the head now. You also try to find that peace by coming here and playing church. Because you come in here and you sit in these pews sometimes, and you got everybody fooled for the most part, a lot of you do. Just because you come in and out, you think you is. Remember what we said a couple weeks ago? You the is and you ain't. I'm going to tell you right now, it's time to quit playing games, folks. Amen? Amen. If you want God's peace, you know what? You're going to have to walk the path. Now, I know you've heard the saying, you got to walk the walk, right? Plenty of preachers on TV right now talking to talk, ain't they? Boy, as a matter of fact, right now, all over TV, it ain't just preachers. Everybody and their brother's on their soapbox right now about something. You know what I'm saying? Five million different things right now going on across our nation. And everybody and their brothers find a soapbox to get on. You know why? Because everybody wants to be heard. Isn't it amazing that we don't seem to want to be heard as clearly about proclaiming that Jesus Christ really is our Lord? Oh, are you a Christian? I know I've said that to you before. You might as well get used to it. You'll hear it a million times more. When are people going to stop asking us? And when are they going to start declaring to us? Oh, you must be a Christian. Well, guess what? One of the ways is they're going to approach you with that in their mouth. They're going to come to you and they're going to say, you know what? You must be a Christian. And you know why I know you must be a Christian? Because it just seems like no matter what happens, you've always got peace. That's right. The guy talking to you right now cannot make that proclamation. I don't always have peace. Not on my face anyway. Not out of my mouth. Hello? All the other preachers are trying to fool everybody into thinking that they're the perfect little old pious man up there behind their podium this morning. God bless their darling hearts and their stupid heads. Amen? Because ain't nobody perfect. Amen? Amen. Amen? But we sure do need to be striving to get there, don't we? Amen. My God, do we ever strive to find this peace. Well, this was kind of shocking the day that I found this because, believe it or not, I pulled open my devotional on my computer Monday morning this past week after a great service last Sunday and as soon as I pulled up my devotional on the computer it just screamed out at me and said here's next Sunday's message just read it look at it pay attention to it and so I started looking at all these scriptures here's what the reminder from God was on Monday July 15th you ready now remember we're talking about the perfect path to peace allow nothing to disturb your calm heart with me let me say that again allow nothing to disturb your calm heart with me. Stop all work until this is restored. Right there's one of the things we forget, don't we? We think that we can just stay busy, 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 busy. And even some of the good things that we stay busy in. You know, I heard somebody say years ago about even being in the ministry, that you can actually be in um, a prison.
prison of sorts in your own ministry. Right. Because you're locked into doing one thing one way, and that's it, you know? Mm -hmm. And so you get this, like, chains about you, almost. You can, you can literally be captive to the very thing that you know in your heart is what you believe is the good thing to do. We don't think about that, though. We don't think about the good things that we do sometimes stopping us from not allowing our calm heart to be disturbed. A case in point. How many of you were running behind getting here this morning? Anybody want to be honest with you? How many of you had affected your attitude at all thinking, Christ, I don't get to the church? Hello? When in reality, when we're heading to church, you know what ought to be on our mind and our heart is, well, praise the Lord. Man, I'm, I'm going to the house of God. I'm going there to worship. I'm not going there to show off for anybody. I'm not going off to, to be an example to anybody but God because when I come to the house of worship, last time I checked, that's me supposed to be worshiping God. It ain't me supposed to be showing you what outfit I got that week, what hat I found that day, what uh, perfume I put on, men, whatever. I don't know what the heck we do to try to point out things to people, but we've got stuff, you know, as well as we do, right? I don't know what all we, we think we need to do before we head to church, but the one thing that is most important that we forget to do often before we head to this place is we forget to allow nothing to disturb our calm heart with God. And so we think the very nature of showing up is part of our worship. You know what? Showing up don't mean anything. I've told you before, dear God, if we had a garage sitting right there, and I walked you out the door and stood you in the garage. We could stand there for six hours. We could sit in that garage floor. We could put grease all in the floor, scooch around in it, get our pants all completely saturated with it. We could sit there and go, burr, 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 and none of us have become a car. <laughs> Hello? Amen. So why do we think we can come in here and go, praise the Lord, thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Oh, peace, peace. Yeah, pray they're a wonderful people. And we think by osmosis we become the saint. Listen, folks. Your relationship with God is not about who can you impress. Your relationship with God is about do you impress Him. Amen. And you're not impressing anybody when you're not walking in His peace. Amen? Amen. Because you know what they're thinking when they look at you and they see you all riled up and, and bushy tailed and my Lord have mercy, you know? Well, they look at you and they say, I, I think I'll just hang out right where I'm at. Hello? Yeah. All right. Let me get off of that day on rabbit trail and get over here I want to be. Stop all work until this is restored. Listen to the last part of it. Do not let those about you spoil your peace of heart and mind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we walk into the place of business where we work, and, and you know, we're actually in a halfway decent mood when we get there because maybe we actually slept seven hours that night instead of five and a half. Maybe we actually got hot coffee instead of lukewarm that day on the way in. Maybe we didn't spill it all over ourselves, you know, before we got into the building. Uh, maybe we got uh, the donut eaten just right without getting it all caught up in our hair and, our, you know, underneath our rings and all that kind of mess, right? Whatever. And so we walk into the office and now we're actually in a decent mood, you know? And right about the time we get to our desk, there comes that person. Now, y'all know which person I'm talking about. Because everybody has a that person. There comes that person, be it man or woman. And immediately, that calm, that peace that you might have walked in with, immediately you're like, you're like a, you ever seen a cat when it gets scared? Yeah. Well, cats are the funniest thing because two things happen. Number one, their backs arch and their hair goes straight up. And, they, and that's what you do. Even funnier than that, have you ever scared a cat when they didn't realize you was anywhere near them? They don't just arch your back and put their hair straight. They actually shoot straight up into the air about six feet. It's crazy to watch. I used to hope I could catch We had like 16 cats on the farm when I was growing up. You know what I'm saying? I used to hope I could catch some of them by surprise because it just thrilled me to watch that cat jump up. Well, you know what? It's thr it thrills that person. The one that you know who I'm talking about. It thrills that person when they walk in and they see you that you was before you, they walk in, you say, <laughs> yeah. and then they walk in, you're like, <laughs> you know what I mean? And suddenly you're riled. Suddenly your peace of heart and mind has been spoiled. All right, you ain't at Psalm 119, 165 by now. You need some tremendous help. 
And I gave you like 15 minutes there, I think. And, all right, great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Listen to that again. Great peace. In the Hebrew, it's the word shalom, and it's the exact same word you're thinking of that the Jews would say to each other in their greeting of either seeing each other or parting from each other. Shalom, shalom. And it literally means peace, the God kind of peace. Great peace have they who? Have they which love thy law. We'll look at that a little more here in a moment. And nothing shall offend them. Now, I tried every way from Sunday to figure out a more theological way to look at this word offend, and there's only one way to define it. You know what it is? Even in the Hebrew, this is the best way to define the word offend. To be a stumbling block. To be a stumbling block. Now, wait a minute. If something is a stumbling block, let's say that I go out here to the parking lot and I start walking every day. And as I'm walking each day, the more familiar I get with that path, the more I begin to realize, okay, there's a bump here, there's a hole here, over here something I ain't figured out yet what it is, but I got three areas here that when I get to them, eventually I get to the point where I know, don't step right there. Hello? So what if I know it like the back of my hand, and I go around to those three, I love what one preacher used to say, I don't know Oklahoma, he does not know how to say obstacle. He says obstacle. <laughs> obstacle. So let's say I got the three obstacles <laughs> right there, right? And, and I know they're there. I know for a fact where they are. I know exactly how far apart they are from each other. I've got it so timed out now, man, I can just about do a blindfold, but when I get up to them, I just decide, there you go. <laughs> Hello? Is it really a stumbling block at that point? What is it at that point on my part? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Remember, ignorant means you didn't know no better, and stupid means you did, you did it anyway. Hello? So you're right, that's stupidity. And so we allow that stupidity. We allow that thing that offends us. We allow that thing that becomes a stumbling block. We allow it to do what it does. Listen to the verse again. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Nothing shall be a stumbling block to them. Okay, now wait a minute. It either is or it ain't. <laughs> which is it? Can things be a stumbling block to us or can they not? Well, apparently there is a way to live that nothing will be a stumbling block to me. And what is that way? Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall be a stumbling block to them. Listen to what it means literally in the Hebrew. Nothing shall cause them to totter, waver, or fall. You remember that old toy from years ago? And they used to even have TV commercials about it. Lord, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you right now. I'm going to already. I'm going to that off. All right. Weevils wobble, but they don't fall down. Anybody remember? Oh, yeah. Little fat bottom bellied creatures, you know, that you'd set them down. They had a heavier bottom than they did top, and they kind of came to a little cone head looking thing. And you'd set them down, and they'd just wobble all around, wouldn't they? You could take it, hold it down, hold its little pointy head down there to the table, and let it go, and it would just go Bing! right back up, wouldn't it? Because yeah. weevils wobble, but they don't fall down. I'm not so sure. Maybe we need the anointing, anointing rather, of weevil. Huh? What do you think? Because nothing shall cause them to totter, waver, or fall. Psalm 73, verses 25 and 26. You'll find it in a minute, but I'm going to go ahead and start reading. Psalm 73, 25 and 26. It is on the screen. Whom have I in heaven but thee? We just sang this. And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. See what you're saying, every bit of it. Let's look at it. Whom have I in heaven but thee? My Lord, have mercy. You ever heard the old saying? You. Everybody take your finger. Point it straight out. Now bend your elbow and point your finger right at your nose. And say, you is me. You is me. You ready? Now that you know that, you and God are a majority. Yep. Hello? In the midst of any situation, in the midst of any disruption, in the midst of any stumbling block, you and 
and God are a majority. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength. It means God is the great rock of refuge. He is my sharp, craggy, pointed cliff of advantage. Remember, I've explained it to you this way before. If we was uh, uh, in, a, in an area where the enemy was after us and there was a way that we could scale the face of that cliff and get to the top of that thing and you look at that cliff and the way that it's built is you can get out there and lay off the edge of it. You can literally see who's coming from below you. Who's got the advantage now? You do because you're above them. They're trying to climb to get to you, right? Yep. And so, man, I mean, you drop things on them, whatever, at that point. But you can also see them coming and you can know what to expect. Do you get that? See, I'm preaching to somebody already this morning. It says, you are my great rock of refuge, my sharp, craggy, pointed cliff of advantage. It says, God is the strength of my heart and my portion. It means my inheritance forever. Take a listen to this. A teacher asked the children in her Sunday school class this question. If I sold my house and my car, had a big garage sale, and gave all my money to the church, would I get into heaven? No. All the children answered. Well, if I cleaned the church every day, mowed the yard, and kept everything neat and tidy, would I get into heaven again? The answer from all the children was, no. Well, she continued, then how can I get to heaven? And in the very back of the room, a little five-year-old boy shouted out, you got to be dead. <laughs> <laughs> Meant to be a joke and serious, by the way. you got to be dead. How do you get to heaven? How do you get the blessing of God? How do you take advantage of the peace of God? You've got to be dead. Dead to what? Dead to sin. Dead to the ways of the world. Dead to the attack of the enemy. You ready for this? Dead to that person. Remember that guy we were talking about a minute ago? Or that girl? Whoever they are? You've got to be dead to all of that. Because the moment I allow any of that to disturb the calmness that God has made available for my heart, I allow that, or them, as it may be, to become a stumbling block. Here's an obstacle to peace, or an obstacle to peace, as my friend would say. Fear of death is an obstacle to peace. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15 says this, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Listen to this same scripture from the contemporary English version. It says, we are people of flesh and blood. Right there is the bigger part of our problem. Not only are we a people of flesh and blood, we usually try to conquer all of our battles in that same flesh and blood. When the Bible makes it very clear that the battle is not flesh and blood. As a matter of fact, the Bible says in the New Testament that the kingdom of God is not meat nor drink. And you can say it this way. The kingdom of God is not flesh and blood. This is a temporary situation. Hello? You know it as well as I do. Go grab somebody's urn that somebody has had one of their loved ones cremated and all they got is cremains hanging on the shelf. Ask them what that is in there. You know what they'll tell you nine times? My sister, my baby sister has one in her house. It's her husband. Yeah, her husband been dead for, I guess, close to a year now. And he's been hanging around in that living room in front of that TV just like he did before he died. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't kidding you, one little bit better. I mean, I know that's kind of funny, and I'm not really trying to be disrespectful. And if Diana was here, she'd be laughing, trust me. She'd go, <laughs> that's right, that's right. All right? But listen, if I ask my sister, if, and, and, and I'll never forget the first time I walked in and I saw the box, because bless her heart, she couldn't afford one of those fancy urns. So I saw the box and I said, uh, it, and as soon as I pointed, went, uh, she went, yeah, that's mine. See, even in her mind, that's still mine. Dude, it's a box. It's about yay big. It's sitting 10 feet from the television. It doesn't get up. It doesn't go to the bathroom. It doesn't go to the refrigerator. You know why? Because it's not mine. Because it's not mine. And what it used to be, it's 
dead. Right. That flesh and that blood is dead. But there's another place that might exist, and I know this with all my heart because I preached his funeral and I know exactly what his life was before. I know the struggles that he came through and I know ultimately what his commitment was. And I know that when he took that last breath, they might have left his remains in that box, but the real Mike went to that wonderful place of perfect, absolute, uninterrupted peace. Here's the crazy thing, though. You don't have to wait till you get to where Mike is to enjoy that perfect peace. Amen. Another preacher friend of mine used to say it this way, God wants you to have just a little bit of heaven right here on earth. And you know what? As great as heaven is, and as eternal as heaven is, even if all we got is just a little menstrual bit of heaven on earth, don't you think that'd be pretty good? Oh, oh yeah. And this wonderful peace is part of what God wants us to have. But the CEB says it this way, contemporary English version, we are people of flesh and blood. That is why Jesus became one of us. He died to destroy the devil who had power over death, but he also died to rescue all of us who live each day in fear of dying. And right there is the number one obstacle. Fear of death is the number one obstacle of God's peace in your heart. Isaiah 35, 4 says this, Say to them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong. Fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. Even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. Listen to this as I break it down. Say to the, them that are of a fearful heart. It means to be liquid or to flow easily. It means melting like wax. As a matter of fact, I don't have this on the screen, but Psalm twenty-two, fourteen says this. David speaking here. He says, I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. Listen. This flesh and blood only knows one way to react. To the wonderful and fearful presence of God. If you're listening, say amen. 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 It melts. But if it melts in the way that God wants it to for you. It means that your heart becomes in his hands. Pliable, shapely, movable. And you're able to allow him to do with you as he pleases. Because after all, for lack of a better term, hot wax, kind of like putty in his hands. Amen? Amen. Be strong, fear not, behold, your God will come with a vengeance. It means that he will come to avenge you. Listen to this. This is the Hebrew. I didn't make this up. He will come to avenge you, and he will punish those who did you harm. Listen, dear heart, when that person who seems to spoil your peace on a regular basis, and remember, not because they can, but because you allow them to, regardless of how your peace is spoiled, if that person does not stop what they're doing, not only to you, because if they're doing it to one person, they're generally doing it to a lot of people. Okay? A bully is a bully is a bully is a bully. Alright? If you haven't figured that out, try to get one of them to finally stand to you toe to toe and see what they do. Okay? Bullies give themselves away very easily because they're cowards. Alright? They usually travel in packs. They very seldom travel alone. Because if they travel alone, they're afraid they might just get called to the table. Hello? A bully is a bully is a bully is a bully. And whoever that person may be, for whatever reason they chose to live the way they lived, for whatever reason they chose to say the things they said or do the things they did against you, why do you think Jesus made it such an important fact in his teachings? Pray for your enemies. Pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you for my name's sake. You know why he wanted you to pray for them? Because without God's mercy in their life, guess what's going to happen? Right here is what's going to happen. God will come to avenge you, and he will punish those whom did you harm. It would be better, Jesus said, that a millstone be hanged about that person's neck who harms one of these little ones. I know the story lends itself to where it sounds like he's talking about little bitty children. And it is, as far as I'm concerned, 
anywhere with anybody today. It's all over the news. Dear God, just pick up your paper, open up your internet, trust me. People are doing things to kids right now that I just do not get. I just don't get it. I used to think I had it bad when I was a child. I apparently didn't have it as bad as some of these dear little sweet ones do today. And I understand that story when he said that if anyone harms one of these little ones, a millstone should be hanged about his neck and he should be cast into depth of the sea. I understand that it lends itself to that thought about little children, but remember who you are. You are his precious little child. And God will come with a vengeance. He will avenge you and punish those who did you harm. All the more reason why you should be praying for them. Who is this? It says, even God with a recompense. And listen what recompense means in the Hebrew. To treat a person well or ill. He will come and save. He will come and rescue and deliver you. Why did we say that? Because so many of us live day after day after day through fear of death subject to bondage. Because all we're afraid of is that death factor. <clears throat> But the death factor, if we allow it to do in our hearts what needs to be done, helps us. It doesn't hurt us. 1 Corinthians 8, 6. God is God, period. What's that mean? God is God, period. What does that statement mean? He's means he's God, period, right? 1 Corinthians 8, 6. But to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Remember when Jesus prayed one day, and he was talking to the Father, and he said, I and my Father are one. He had just gotten through praying, and he looked at the disciples and anybody else who was listening, and he said, I and my Father are one. But in the prayer that he had prayed, he said, God, I realize that we are one. But I pray that you would make them one with us. So Jesus and God are one. There's no doubt about it. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Yes, they are three distinct, purposeful beings, but they are one. Why? Because they are of one heart, one mind, one accord, perfect unity. There is no separation Amen. as far as the job that they set out to do. Amen? Amen. 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 What creates the separation in our hearts? Fear, doubt, unbelief. We forget that not only are we of God the Father and in Him, but we are made by Jesus Christ. We are by Him. Remember, yeah. when Genesis says God said, if you read later on, you'll notice that the Bible says that it was Jesus who made the formation, who did the creation. You say, well, I thought it was God. It was. Yeah. It is. It always will be. Amen. Why do you think nine times out of ten when I refer to a uh, proclamation from Jesus from the New Testament, you almost always hear me say, Jesus says. Now, if I'm referring to it in the text of taking you back a little further and then coming back again, I'll sometimes say said. But anytime I'm praying and I remind God of something that is in the New Testament, written in red in my red letter edition, hello, Y'all know what I mean, right? That means it's whose words? It means it's Jesus' words, right? And when I'm praying and those words come to my heart, and I remind God of that, you know how I say it to him? Father, Jesus says. Right. Because he's still saying it to him today. I'll show you that at the end of the message here in just a second. Isaiah 26, 3. Remember, God is God, period. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace. Now see, there's that phrase, perfect peace. Right now we're talking about the perfect path to this peace. We know the peace is perfect. We've got to have this perfect path. Here's, here's, have you seen those commercials for uh, car max? And they're like freaking out over they need a car or they need an appraisal or whatever. And all of a sudden in the midst of nowhere there comes the start line. Well, look at it. And what do they do? They start running like an idiot down there, you know, chasing that start line, right? I think we need a start line. Wouldn't it be nice if Right at the end of our prayer, we were like, Oh, Father, ask you to help me to do this today. Help me to please you in all that I do. In Jesus' name, amen. And you opened your eyes and you looked down and there was a start line. And it started moving. Would you be smart enough to follow? Huh? No, most of us would go, <laughs> Oh, what is that? Huh? Hello? You ready? You got a start line every day. You got your own personal.
personal start line every day. You know what it's called? The mercy of God is new every morning. You wake up from the day before, and God looks at you and He says, Don't be concerned about this thing. I've already put it out of my remembrance. I'm not thinking about it anymore, so don't you think about it anymore. Here's my mercy. Instead of start, it says mercy. Here's my mercy. I follow it. Follow it. Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. But God, I've got these bills over here. Yes, but I'm going to help you take care of them. But God, my body is racked with pain. Yes, but I'm going to help you through this. But God, my mom, my grandma, my aunt, my sister, my brother, my uncle, whoever, someone that I love needs you so badly. They need you to touch them. Yes, and I'm there for them just like I am. Oh, you. What am I often forgetting to do when I'm allowing the circumstances to disturb my calm heart, the calm heart that God wants me to have with Him. I'm allowing those obstacles, I'm allowing those disturbances to take my mind off of Him. Because this Word promises you and me that He will keep you in perfect peace if your mind, your thoughts, are on Him. Why do you do that? It says because you trust in Him, because He trusteth in thee. Psalm 16, 11, Thou wilt show me the path of life. See, I told you, you wake up, you look down, and doesn't say start. It says mercy. Every morning. As a matter of fact, if you look right over here, parentheses, right there before, the real fine print, it says any day, new. New. Because God's mercy is what every morning? It is new. Every morning. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. Now remember, we're talking about the perfect path to peace. We know the peace is perfect. But we need the perfect path. We're starting to see it here. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace. Here's part of the path. My mind is stayed on Him. I trust in Him. He shows me this path, this perfect path. How? In His presence. In thy presence is fullness of joy. It's another key to the path, being in His presence. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. You know what the right hand of God is? It's always indicative of His power and His righteousness. Proverbs 10, 19. In the multitude of words, there wanteth not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. Here's another key to the path. Listen to this from the contemporary English version. You will say the wrong thing if you talk too much. Oh, boy. <laughs> Have any of us ever been there? Oh, yeah. You know, you got one of those days going where you're doing pretty good. You know what I'm saying? You know, some people just don't know when to quit. Have you figured that out? You, you got said what you needed to say. You don't really need to worry about it. It's go, go ahead and get up. It's okay to get up out of your chair now and just leave. But we get this weird feeling. I'm talking to you from personal experience because I remember I used to be way bad at this. For some strange reason, in the back of my mind, I felt, until I know beyond all shadow of doubt that I got you so caught and picking, convinced that I'm right and you're wrong, I ain't going anywhere. Hello? <laughs> Say what's on your mind. Say what's on your heart. And be done. Right. When you talk too much, guess what happens? Well, listen to the CUV. You will say the wrong thing if you talk too much. So, be sensible and watch what you say. When you talk too much and you start trying to figure out how you can make the situation more what you need it to be, you start saying stupid things. Hello? Let's go ahead and bring that word back into the message. You start saying things that just don't make sense. Yep. You start saying things that make people start thinking about you going, uh-huh, yeah, 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 
I knew I shouldn't let this guy come in here today. There he is. Hello? We've all heard it. How many ears have you got? Two. How many mouths have you got? One. So you should be doing One. More here. twice as much listening as you do talking. All right. Last scripture and we'll be done. This is Isaiah 55, verses 10 through 13. This will not be on the screen. If you'd like to turn there, fine. If not, write it down. You can check it out later. Isaiah 55, verses 10 through 13, where we are sealing for you the understanding of this perfect path to peace. And I've shown you that, first of all, he's God and God alone. Amen? I've shown you that your mind has to stay on him. I've shown you that you have to trust in him. I've shown you that you should spend time in his presence. I've shown you that at that place there are pleasures forevermore. And I've just now shown you that if you talk too much, you're going to get yourself in trouble. Amen. But now I'm going to say to you, unless. And here's the unless. Isaiah 55, verses 10 through 13. For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. For ye shall go out with joy. Listen to this next part. Amazing as it is, it fits. Ye shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. Wait a minute. And be led forth. <coughs> you ever see the old cartoons where they're trying to get that old mule to get out there and dig that dirt, pull that plot? And they'll often have it where they stick that piece of wood across his head, they belt it to his head in some way and put that carrot out there on the end of that old thing. You know, he's trying to get that carrot the whole time. You know, the whole point is to keep him moving forward, right? Yep. So they want him to go along the path, and they're trying to give him some incentive to stay along that path. Now listen. For you shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. God's peace ought to be the carrot at the end of your stick. God's peace ought to be your ultimate goal in everything that you do. Every word that you say, every move that you make, if you're still listening, say amen. 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 They shall go out with joy, for you shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth, break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of thorn, instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. You know the, the important thing to realize about that? Is that because of the fall of Adam and Eve, the earth became cursed. And God told Adam and Eve and all of their folks that would follow them, from now on, you're going to work yourself to death to get anything out of this earth. Because everything that you try to achieve, you're going to have to pull it through thorns and thistles. Because it was cursed. Their disobedience to God had allowed the earth to become cursed. Now with that in mind, remember that in the midst of that curse, God says here that if I'll do what he's telling me to do about his word, his word coming out of my mouth. Say this after me. I need, I need God's, word God's word to be coming out of my mouth. Say it again. I need, I need God's, God's word to be coming out of my mouth. Say this. I need to quit need to saying quit. stupid things. Hello. Well, I've had fun with this message because I've, I've got to say stupid about 14 times. <laughs> I usually get fussed at really bad after I say even at once, but Y'all said it yourself back there, a couple of you did in the beginning, remember? So y'all gave me a license to keep going. <laughs> Let's not speak stupid things, amen. Let's speak God's word because guess what it does? That curse that is existent, suddenly the curse has to bow its knee. Listen to how. Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree. And instead of the briar 
shall come up the myrtle tree. And it shall be to thee, uh, and it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign, that thou shalt not be cut off. <laughs> for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. What sign? An everlasting sign. You know what sign he's talking about? Oh yeah. It's that little agreement called covenant. Where God says, in Jeremiah, we have time to go there, so I'll just quote it to you. I know the plans that I have for you. That's right. And God's plans are not the ones that you think they often are, because God's not Thor. God's not whatever worst person you can imagine. Okay? God's not your enemy. God's not that person that we were talking about earlier. God loves you. God wants His best in your life. And He wants His perfect peace to rule in your hearts. But it's up to you. Yeah. Speak His word. Again, let's look at those most important signs here, or most important parts of this path. Keep your mind on Him. Trust in Him. Stay in His presence. Remember that His right hand brings pleasure. That means His power. If you're in His presence, you'll see His power. And remember to watch your words. Let what comes out of your mouth be what God would have you say. Amen. Would you close, close your eyes? Right here. Father, I thank you today for your word. And I pray that we've accomplished what you wanted accomplished today. Interestingly enough, Lord, is that scripture that we just read from Isaiah very clearly shows us that the very nature of your word is for it to accomplish what you sent it forth to do. And so I pray that your word would accomplish in each life, in each heart, of each person under the sound of my voice right now. I pray that your word would accomplish in their lives what you want it to. But I pray that you would begin to help them see how important it is for them to begin to speak your words. Help them to begin to see themselves the way that you see them. Help them to begin to see themselves as that wonderful, precious little child that you love dearly. So much, in fact, that you died for us. So much more, in fact, that you went to hell for us. And yet you took those keys of death and hell and you came out of that grave. And you are now seated at the right hand of the Father. And you, Lord Jesus, even now, as I speak, when you look to the Father, as any of us in this room, when we speak to the Father, Lord Jesus, you turn to him and you say, Father, I purchased their right to have that. I purchased their cleansing with my blood. I remind you that I am the reason. Lord, help us to see that. Help us to know that. Help us to see that in you we live and move and have our being. Help us to see that we are not our own. We are bought with a price. Help us to see that the person that we so often get disgusted with in the mirror is not who we really are. Because, Lord, you can make a difference. Help us to find, maintain, and finish the perfect path to your peace. Every head bowed, every eye closed, just for a moment. Do you need to let him know this morning that that you love him. You need to let him know that you may have been silent about it. You may have kind of hidden it. You may have been even a little bit bashful. You need to let him know this morning that you're not ashamed to raise your hand and say, Jesus, I believe. If you need him in your heart this morning, you need to make that commitment. Amen. I see those hands. Father, I thank you now for these that have raised their hands. And Lord, I know their hearts. And I pray.
pray that you would work in them in the way that you need to. And I thank you, Father, that each one of them are growing, I have no doubt. Father, I pray for not only those who raise their hands, but for the rest of us as well. Help us to stick to this path. Help us to please you. Help us to strive to be all that you want us to be in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. 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 All right, before we leave.